Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Selena Zhang, and I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships here at the Canadian Urban Institute. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's City Talk session on Indigenous Practitioner Perspectives on City Building. CUI is so pleased to be partnering on this event with our colleagues at the Canadian Institute of Planners, the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects, Engineers Canada, the National Trust for Canada, the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, the Urban Development Institute, and the Urban Land Institute. We have such a great group of partners on this, and uh, I just want to extend such a warm thank you to all of them for all of our continuous work on, on putting this together. Today, I'm calling in from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Anishinaabeg nations. Thank you to everyone for being here. We had an overwhelming amount of interest in this session with over a thousand people registering from across the country. Many of you are here already. I know others are gonna trickle in as the minutes go on. Thank you for choosing to spend some of your time on this National Indigenous Peoples Day with us. I can only speak for myself as a first generation settler in um, uh, one of many settler run organizations in this country, in a country that is shaped by colonialism, in a country with a history of broken treaties, in a country whose cities have been built by city builders who've created physical and social legacies of exclusion in many different ways across the landscapes of our communities. I know I have a lot to learn. I know my organization has a lot to learn. And I remind myself every day about reconciliation as a daily practice, as something that needs to extend beyond single moments of reckoning into ongoing conversation um, and practice. And I know that's why so many of you are here with us today as well, um, to really listen to this great group of people engage around questions about what that looks like and, and hear about Indigenous practitioners about their perspectives on our disciplines. Um, and so it's gonna be a great hour of listening and learning and reflecting um, just some housekeeping before we get started, feel free to pop into the chat and let us know where it is that you're calling from. Switch your toggle to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your remarks now and throughout the session. Um, and if you know whose land you're on, feel free to make a land acknowledgement of your own. Today's session has live closed captioning, uh, which is automatically turned on at the bottom of your screen. If you wish to turn it off, there's a toggle at the bottom of your screen that allows you to do that. Uh, this session is also being recorded, so if you need to jump off early or if you know somebody who really wanted to be here or who should have been here um, that and want to send this, this event to after the fact, you'll be able to uh, see this at our website at citytalkcanada.ca. Now that's enough for me. Let me pass it on to who you are here to see. So I'm so, so pleased that this session is being moderated by our friend in Edmonton, Hunter Cardinal. Hunter is a person extraordinaire. He's an actor, he's an indigenous myth architect. He's the co-founder and director of story at Nahiawin. And he was also recognized as Edmonton's best actor and um, was also in Edmonton's top 40 under 40. So he's a, he's a man of many skills, many talents, many stories. Um, so uh, Hunter, over to you. Amazing, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you all so much for, for having me and for making space uh, for us to share some, some time with you all this morning. Um, just a quick little background about me. I'm calling in from Edmonton on Treaty 6 territory, as well as the Métis Nation of Alberta's uh, Region 4. Um, but my family on my dad's side, we're Sage Weinawak, which means um, Woodland Cree from the Sucker Creek Cree First Nation up in Treaty 8 represent. And uh, also on my mom's side, we are Polish and French Jews by way of Israel New York. So I'm really fortunate to have those histories and tasty foods with me in my life. Um, so what I thought we would do to kind of begin in a good way is I thought that I would invite you all to partake in a digital smudge. 
Um, so this isn't mandatory. Uh, so for those who, who want to perhaps take a little stretch or center yourself in whatever way is comfortable for you, uh, feel free to go and do that. Um, what I'll do is I'll explain a little bit about what smudging is, how to do it, uh, and then I'll lead us in a brief prayer. Now, um, before we go any further, um, this is just what I've been taught. There's so many different ways to smudge, um, but essentially why we smudge. Um, I've been taught that we smudge to cleanse ourselves, um, to seal out that negativity and seal in the positivity in our lives. Um, I've also been told that we smudge to intention set, to remind ourselves of what we're here to do, why we're doing it, and also what are the values that we wish to have kind of guiding us in what we're doing. Um, I've also been told once again that we smudge to call in our ancestors, those on the other side to come sit with us and the creator as well to help guide the work that we're doing so it's done from a good way, uh, from a good place, from that centered place of, of who we are at our best. Um, so how we smudge. That's going to differ. There are so many different ways to smudge. Um, it's going to differ by your family, uh, culture, as well as environment. So some use uh, certain medicines. Some ask you to take off your jewelry. Um, some ask you to stand as well. Um, what I've been taught is that sincerity is the highest form of prayer. So if you're coming to this um, from a good place um, with really good intentions, um, you're good to go. Uh, it doesn't matter really what it looks like. Um, as well, I've also been told that your jewelry and your glasses, that they're a part of who you are. Um, so you can feel free to keep them on while you're smudging. Um, I've also been told that um, you should use what you have around you to connect in your own way. And that's particularly important um, as we're gathering online as uh, instead of in person. Um, and the elder that we work with very often, Francis Whiskey Jack, uh, directed us uh, for how to do this virtually. So uh, I'm really honored to be sharing that with you all. And um, yeah, so what it's going to look like, and I'm getting a bit excited, um, is uh, I'm going to be burning uh, this sage right here, as you can see. And uh, what you're going to see is in a moment, um, there's going to be some smoke coming up. Now that smoke is that symbolic cleansing that we want to use. Um, and it's also our connection to the creator and to all things. And it's also been said that our thoughts and our prayers go up with um, that smoke to the creator. Uh, and that's how they're able to hear us. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking that digital smudge, that smoke, and we're going to be bringing that clarity to different parts of ourselves that need it. So what I've been taught um, is I, I like to typically take off my glasses and kind of give them a nice smudge. Um, and then what I do is I bring that clarity to my eyes so I can see good things, my ears so I can hear good words and good thoughts, my mouth so I can speak good words um, and, and good thoughts, because it's a very powerful medicine, our words and what we say. Um, I also bring it to my heart to remind myself to be open to everyone around me. Uh, sometimes if I'm feeling it, I'll put it uh, over my legs to make sure that I'm on the right path in life. Uh, and then especially lately, I've been bringing it over myself to kind of finish really asking for that, that health um, and that well-being. Um, so what I'll do is I will show you all once again when it's lit, um, what I'll do, and then I will then hold it up to the camera um, for you all to pretend as if I'm right across from you. You can kind of take that, that smudge and just kind of go and do whatever feels right to you. Um, there's no wrong way to do this, um, as I've been taught. So if you feel like, you know, I don't remember all the different things that Hunter just said, don't worry about it. If you're coming at it from that sincere place, you're good to go. Um, so I will light this. Um, I'm using a lighter today. Um, sometimes I use matches. Um, some folks say use one or the other. Um, I've been told that um, it, it doesn't matter per se. So that's what I'm doing. So great. Amazing. So that's how I do it. Now I'm going to hold it up to the camera so everyone at home can smudge. And we'll just take a moment and uh, you do what feels right. Wow. 
Wonderful. Hi, hi. Thank you, everyone, for, for taking part in that, for those that joined us. Um, Right now, I'll just close this off by saying um, a brief prayer just to intention set. Um, I encourage everyone to pray in their own way, whatever's comfortable for you. You don't have to participate. So if you need to stretch, get some water, pet a cat, go ahead and do that. Uh, I want to call in our ancestors, all of our ancestors, those on the other side to come sit with us today as we listen and learn and share um, in a good way with our hearts and our minds open. Uh, as we dream of a better future. Um, I also want to call in that spirit and intent of, of our um, original treaties as Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, um, that spirit of peace, friendship, and understanding that's to guide our actions together, always reminding us to make room for each other and continue growing in a good way as we continue down this river of life um, and uh, as we're walking towards being and becoming better people, each other. Hi, hi. Kenan Amazing. All right. I'm so excited to begin um, our time together. So uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to invite all of our panelists to uh, turn on the cameras, unmute yourselves, um, so you can uh, meet this wonderful audience that we have here today. So you can all take the time to, yeah, there we go. Amazing. Okay. This is so great. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you all to uh, take turns introducing yourself, sharing a little bit about kind of who you are, who you're from as well. Um, how does your work contribute to city building? Um, so I will start with, because uh, I have the power of uh, moderation. So I'm going to begin uh, with Aladia. Would you like to introduce yourself? And then after Aladia, we'll go to Danilo. Bonjour, Ani. Kejigaba week in Dijnakas, Obashika Kang and Donjaba, Wabashke Mayingan and Dodam. I'm Lady of Smoke, uh, Principal Architect with Smoke Architecture. Really thrilled to be working with a team at my firm that's mostly consisted, all consisting of women, and mostly consist consisting of Indigenous women. And uh, we feel exciting times ahead as we uh, sort of see so many new projects. Uh, uh, inviting perspectives that have been so sublimated in Canadian culture, those identities that have been built up over millennia of inhabitation of territory. So I'm joining you today from Nswakmuk, which is Sudbury, and um, it's uh, in the Robinson-Huron Treaty area. And uh, I happen to be here today because I'm helping out a friend, and, uh, but, but I'm normally I'm in uh, Hamilton, Ontario, which is also Anishinaabe territory, uh, but also close to Haudenosaunee and, um, and here on Wendat down there. So that's where I'm normally at. Um, so good morning and uh, well, afternoon now. <laughs> and hello to everyone. Happy to be here. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, Danilo, we'll go over to you next. And then after Danilo, we'll go um, to Naomi. Bonjour, good job. Danilo Dendishikas, Wabazesh Nindoro, Kamups Nindunjuba, Sagamak Anishinaabek First Nation Divindagos, Ninshigudaya Vancouver, Nimigwich Wendam, Geni Nongo Mampi Gibijayan. Hello, I'm Danilo. Um, I'm um, from the Martin clan and I'm originally from Kamloops, BC. Um, I'm a member of the Sagamak Anishinaabek First Nation and I currently live in Vancouver and I'm very, very pleased to to be here today, I'm calling from the Musqueam traditional ancestral and unceded territory. And uh, a little bit about the, the work I do. I'm very fortunate to kind of, um, to have a, wear a couple different hats. Uh, one is with the UBC Applied Sciences faculty, uh, supporting our indigenous engineering students. I'm a recent grad from that program. I'm currently doing my master's in civil engineering. And, um, as a new engineer, uh, engineering and training, um, I'm very fortunate that I've been asked and brought on board to lend my Indigenous perspective to the work that we're doing on a specific project. So uh, I'm, I'm fortunate um, that I can combine, you know, some of my passions and my culture uh, with the work I do. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Danilo. Uh, Naomi, I'll toss it over to you and then we'll go to Lorna. Great, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Naomi Raddy. I am calling from Treaty One territory in the homeland of the Métis Nation here in Winnipeg. 
Um, I wear a few different hats, but so for one of my hats, I am currently a master of landscape architecture student at the University of Manitoba in my practicum year. Um, my practicum is focused on, um, it, or the title, sorry, is called Lost Natures, Visualizing Anishinaabe Foodways um, from St. Peter's Peguis. Um, so I'm working with my community on understanding connections to the land through the lens of food and food security. Um, it's been an exciting and complicated journey um, that I'm still on. So we'll see where it leads me, but I'm, I'm grateful for all the lessons that I've learned so far. Um, I'm also the uh, co-founder of the Indigenous Design and Planning Students Association. Um, we recently launched a book called Voices of the Land, um, which is something that we're, we're really proud of. And we've been given a lot of space in a lot of the design communities to discuss the work that we've done. Um, so I'm hopeful to speak about that later on today. Um, and I'm also a member of the uh, CSLA's Reconciliation Advisory Committee. And um, for my work, I am a uh, technical researcher and landscape architectural intern with Envision Insight Group, which is a um, Indigenous consulting firm with offices in Ottawa and Kalawit. Amazing. Thank you so much, Naomi. Uh, we'll go over to Lorna and then to wrap it up, we'll go to Tony. Good morning. Um, I'm uh, Lorna Crochu. I am uh, a member of the uh, Blackfoot Confederacy of Southern Alberta, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I wanted to start out by just acknowledging Hunter and Hunter, thank you so much for um, the prayer and um, the blessing this morning. And for also acknowledging our ancestors because it's really important that we understand um, as indigenous Canadians, but also non-indigenous Canadians, the meaning of ancestral lands. And um, sometimes we forget that indigenous people still have a strong relationship with our ancestors, especially when we are, we are on the land. So in working with our traditional knowledge keepers, um, that's the first thing that I learned was we honor, um, we honor our ancestors. And so it's important when we go out and uh, work with whomever, uh, developers, planners, um, architects, uh, I think it's important for them to understand that most Canadian cities are built on ancestral lands, but we also are treaty people. And so members of the treaty uh, communities need to understand what that means. And so um, I'm very uh, conscientious of that when we are working with indigenous monuments, when we're working on the landscape, when we're working with um, our creation stories um, and also our uh, stories um, about, uh, for example, we use the term nappy in our, in our indigenous communities in Southern Alberta. And so they're the trickster stories. And all of these stories combined really are about the ancestral land. So we cannot forget that we have that relationship. And those are one of the many relationships we have on the land. So thank you for that. Hey, hi, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, next, we'll go to Tony, and then we'll dive into our discussion. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tony Lara. I'm a community planner. I'm from Cowes' First Nation, which is in Treaty 4 territory in southeastern Saskatchewan. I, I moved uh, to Saskatoon to go to university like 14 years ago, and so I continue to live and work in Treaty 6 territory here in Saskatoon. Um, I, ha I have a degree in regional and urban planning. However, my work primarily focuses on supporting and working alongside Indigenous communities to create strategies and plans for community development. Um, and the work that I do often permeates between rural and urban uh, communities, because oftentimes the communities I work with, 50% or more of their community live in urban centers. And so the type of community development that I get excited about isn't just defined by the boundaries of a city or a town or a reserve community. It's quite uh, a bit bigger. 
Um, so I'm excited. I'm excited to talk about this in the realm of like city building. Uh, but I think, you know, we often can break out of that um, bubble pretty easily when we talk about community and um, the goals that come from community. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Well, let's let's dive into it then. Um, so the first question that I have for um, you all here, uh, and you know, we we probably won't have time for everyone to go. So um, if anyone's particularly interested in answering this, um, feel free to go and do so. So no particular order. Um, but how do you incorporate indigenous ideas into your work? So uh, this can be on you know a really high level. Um, kind of what are the, the guiding values or even something very small and tangible like how you approach engagements or, or even start your day. Um, so I'll open the floor to uh, our panelists uh, if, if any of you want to share and, and we can kind of kick things off. I'll start. Um, for my work at the city of Calgary, um, we, we, we started the discussion around matters of historical significance and matters of contemporary significance. And I think it's it's a way to open up discussions with um, non-Indigenous people in a way that um, this is what it was for our, um, for, for our ancestors on the land prior to treaties. And I think the, the matters of uh, contemporary significance is how things have changed over time that we can start having those discussions around really contemporary matters. And there's a big difference between the two. So matters of historical significance, um, again, uh, just um, taking into consideration that we work with traditional knowledge keepers, that they have a relationship to the land. So prior to development, um, they go through these ceremonies on the land and uh, the ceremonies are very meaningful um, because they're apologizing to mother earth before any development occurs. Mm -hmm. Matters of contemporary significance are things like um, how do we honor that indigenous monument that was um, really important to the sustenance of um, of, of being in this area prior to contact. So I think when we, when we begin to establish those kinds of activities, then we begin to understand that there are protocols that we work with, with indigenous knowledge keepers, but there are also our protocols that we work with on the land. So we have relationships, very close relationships with the land as a, as a entity, as a living source. So I think those things are really important for us as we move towards um, sort of things like within the realm of reconciliation. So I just wanted to add that piece. Thank you. Absolutely. No, that's wonderful. Um, anyone else uh, quickly want to share how, how they go about approaching that Indigenous perspective or ideas into the work that they're doing? I can share a quick little bit about the work that I do. Often, um, I, I feel really grateful. I get to go right into community, um, again, rural and urban, and have discussions directly with citizens of nations about, you know, what is currently affecting them and how they hope to see their community develop and the impacts and outcomes that they would like to see for themselves and their families. Um, and I get the amazing task to work with them to amplify those um, those aspirations and create a roadmap. So oftentimes my work is really specific to each nation, um, which I feel super grateful that every time, every time I have a discussion with a new community, I feel super grateful that I get to be a part of that dialogue and, and amplify those goals. Totally. Um, uh, Tony, that's wonderful. And I'm, I'm curious if you can, um, you know, as our, I think our first question, I'm really interested in um, what are some of the important things that you keep in mind when you're engaging with those communities? Um, and what do you hope typically that, you know, other organizations focus on when engaging communities in that similar work? You know, I think that it's, it's really important. I'm curious, you know, how you go about navigating those conversations. Yeah, I... Um... I, like, I love clickbait and I wish it was like a BuzzFeed, like top 10 things to like, know. I couldn't, I couldn't like create enough time to create that great article, but yeah. I, I did narrow it down to a few. <laughs> um, I think like the, 
the first piece is um, being curious, but humble, like taking the time to um, learn both nationally and really locally about um, historic and current contexts that communities are dealing with. Like Lorna had mentioned, those are different, but like integrated things. And uh, I feel so lucky to be like alive right now uh, with social media and, and so many great indigenous um, artists and knowledge keepers who are like graciously developing a bunch of material. So taking the time to really like get to know uh, space uh, and like what communities are dealing with is like really important. And I also think it's important to understand like where you're coming from in that as well, right? Like what is your, what is your history when you're working with those communities? Um, the other thing I really like, I just, I just learned this term a few months ago, I, I was working with a chief in Southern Saskatchewan and oftentimes there's like the, uh, build capacity in community, which is good, but he's like, listen, that's assuming we don't have capacity in our communities. What we need to do is strengthen that capacity. That capacity is there. We need to amplify it. We need to lift it up and we need, it's a two way learning. So we're, we're teaching something, but we also have the ability to learn from community as well. Um, and in a really specific way, that means like hiring local businesses, creating positions on your projects that are paid um, to have somebody job shadow. Do that so much and so well that you're working yourself out of work. I work, I work in a consulting space and I often will think if I'm not doing my job good enough, like I gotta be able to think about how this work goes on without me there. So working yourself out of work is really important and strengthening uh, local capacity is also like really important. And the, the final one that I really wanna highlight is being practical and outcomes driven. Like oftentimes I, I kind of get pouty as a planner. Like I don't want my plans to just sit on a shelf mm -hmm. uh, or the community plans to sit on a shelf and collect dust. If the most practical thing is a one page really high level thing to make that, right? If that's the most attainable thing for the community, um, making sure that it's outcomes focused. I, I really truly believe our communities know uh, what they need. They just, they need some help mapping that out, right? And so um, making sure that it's outcomes focused and authentic to the community. You're not coming in with all the answers. You're actually there to help share some tools. And if those tools don't fit, like have the courage to kind of bust them apart and create something new. It's kind of like a fun place where we get to work in because we're not trying to replicate the way it's been done. We're trying to create something new. So having some courage to do that. Those are my, those are the top three things. That's amazing. Uh, I kind of wanted to expand on, on the first point, Tony, and I have a, a question for you based off of that is, um, you know, for those folks who want to be engaging with Indigenous communities and are in that preparation phase for before they start engaging and they're, and they're doing their research and stuff like that, do you have any like ad advice or guidance for um, uh, for when they've done enough research or or what is enough? Is there anything that you know makes you feel like within your work like okay, I feel you know confident enough to engage in that good way um, after you know going through the process of learning who I'm engaging with? I don't know if this is the right answer, but this is the first thing that comes to mind for me is uh, often like relationship building, like literally like having a conversation and multiple conversations with people we want to be engaging with like early and often and throughout that answer kind of starts to come out in itself. Like you can't isolate yourself. You'll drive yourself crazy. I think if you just sit there and worry about all the what ifs, but in the end, like we're human beings who are trying to build relationships with one another. And I think if we approach it in that way, and, and I loved your point at the beginning around sincerity, like, if we're sincere and honest and humble about that, I, th I think those answers start to come out. Beautiful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, Lorna, you've led some like pretty incredible policy development um, in uh, Calgary, for example, the city of Calgary's Indigenous policy and Indigenous policy framework. Um, so, you know, from your experience in providing leadership on specifically the White Goose Flying Report, um, which is, for those of you who may not be familiar, basically the city of Calgary's path towards reconciliation. Um, what is your advice uh, to municipalities that want to take meaningful steps and actions um, towards writing relations with Indigenous peoples? 
And, uh, you know, even building off of that, like what ability to incite lasting change do policymakers have, which, you know, excites you personally um, in this respect? Well, I think education goes a long way. If we cannot um, help support, and that's part of the capacity, capacity building as well. If we cannot support our institutions um, to, to learn and educate, then we're, we're sort of, that, that's part of the barrier. We can't go forward because if we wanna go forward, we have to be sort of on the same plane going forward. And I think education goes a long way. Um, sometimes we work with um, institutions and I'm not just any institution. I think um, if you can't, if, if, if you don't know, then we can't move forward um, in, in sort of building this, um, this uh, I, I guess, policy together. We can't move forward on, on building TRC together. Um, so I think education goes a long way. And I think we have many, many educators in the Indigenous community who could come and help and assist us. So it's not lack of, 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 of people not having the knowledge and the educational background to come and help our institutions. It's also um, a responsibility for institutions to say, we need that support, we need that help. Um, how can we, uh, how, how can we play a role in this? And the big thing like on the weekend, of course, is ONDRIP, right? And ONDRIP speaks very loudly to, um, I guess, planning, right? Because there's a role for planning in ONDRIP. And, and we need to go a step further and begin to learn about ONDRIP and um, the work that we have to do in terms of Aboriginal and treaty rights and how it relates to the land again and how, it, how those relationships are built through ONDRIP. So there's some big pieces coming up through the TRC I think we need to start paying attention to, but we need um, non-Indigenous Canadians to be our supporters, to be our allies in moving forward on these, on these subjects. And to really understand, for example, um, things like our protocols. And so we're all in this together. Um, we've heard enough about we are all treaty people. Well, we are all uh, Canadians. And I think we, we need the support of all Canadians in moving forward with some of, whether it's policy, whether it's ONDREP, whether, you know, wh whatever it is, we need that support. Thank you. Absolutely, yeah. Lorna, so what I'm hearing is like really being aware of those foundational documents. Absolutely, Be yeah. If you can't, I mean, like residential school has been on our radar screen mm -hmm. and um, we have to understand, I've, I've been in my community, especially on the weekend and, and talking to folks in my community, we have these spring ceremonies that we attend and everybody right now in, in, in my community and in, in the Blackfoot community, everybody is, is feeling traumatized right now. And so when, you, when people are feeling traumatized, they feel somewhat hopeless. So we have to allow that hope to come back um, and, and be part of our, our reality and be, part, be on our radar screen um, because Indigenous people want to move forward in some way. But for whatever reason, sometimes we get, we get held back. So we have to be hopeful that we can continue to move forward on any of these subjects, whether it's TRC or Indigenous policy making, whether it's contemporary or historical, we need to find a way to move forward. And I think education is going to help lead us um, in that direction. Hi, hi, awesome. Thank you so much, Lorna. Thank um, you. Aladia, um, in your work, um, you intersect with some pretty exciting things, um, land, structural problems, uh, structural problem solving, and you know, both indigenous and non-indigenous ways of knowing and being. So I'm, I'm really curious in what ways that you found both in and non-Indigenous knowledges, how they exist and also can work together. Because, um, you know, for me in my journey of learning, I always saw them as exclusive and never really saw them as potentially being um, complementary, um, but both equally valid ways of looking at the world. 
I asked um, uh, one of our, I guess, I guess we should probably call her an elder now because she's a retired architect, the very first First Nations heritage architect or indigenous heritage architect ever to have practiced and been licensed in Canada. Her name is Har Harriet Burdett Moulton. Um, there are very few of us. Um, we need more. So if anybody on, on the you know, in the attendee list uh, has a young person, especially if she's a woman who's considering career choices, I would very much advocate for architecture and building industry in general, because we need more. <laughs> so it was wonderful to meet Tony, for instance, um, uh, because I love to see our young people coming up in the profession and wonderful to see Naomi um, working in landscape, um, we're desperate for more landscape architects uh, with that Indigenous perspective. So welcome, we have to stay in touch. Um, so um, these are exciting times when our, our people are actually starting to be rep represented in the space making and place keeping professions. Uh, so Harriet Burdett Moulton, um, uh, said to me that the most important thing about Indigenous architecture and the benefits to be gained by integrating Indigenous perspectives in built space is uh, wellness. So uh, when you unpack that, I think it has to do with the fact that Canada and Canadians at large have been struggling along, even Indigenous peoples have been struggling along without our ancestral teachings. Those teachings are based in a connection, a deep connection to land. And uh, we've been trying uh, our best to make beautiful places without the benefit of millennia of knowledge that have been carefully, carefully built up and carried so dedicated and, and carefully by our knowledge carriers um, through incredible hardship. Um, you know, the death camps that we call residential schools that stole our children and traumatized entire generations for 150 years and only just closed within the last uh, 30 or 40. Um, you know, those, those places uh, stole so much from us and not just Indigenous peoples, they stole from Canadians in general because my view is if you were born in these territories, this is part of your identity. This is part of your birthright. You have a right to know what Indigenous peoples have to share. What we've seen is when we integrate Indigenous perspectives into spaces, we have a great richness of understanding that comes forward and creates places that allow for um, diversity, that allow for accessibility, that allow us to adhere to our protocols that um, reconnect us to the life systems that support us reconnect with each other, that concept of Nidinoe uh, Maganadog, all our relations, you know, is so powerful. And that disconnect that we feel in many built spaces comes from a complete sublimation of foundational belief systems that originated in our territories. So the way to get that back is to talk with and listen to Indigenous peoples and implement what they tell you. And that's what I think um, we could all benefit from. The, the spaces we create will become regenerative, they'll become enjoyable, and they'll have that identity that Canada keeps searching for, that core identity that is us. Because the types of teachings that we hear from our elders and knowledge carriers, all of the clients I've worked with, are true. They're, they ring true because they come from a place of understanding and connection to land. And that is something we all share. So I can't see, wait to see more of that. We've been uh, collaborating with architects to achieve this. And I, I really hope that our young people who are coming up into the profession continue this really good work because we need more of us doing it. We only have, I think, um, like I can count on one hand, the uh, women, uh, indigenous practitioners in my profession of architecture. They're very, they're not enough of us. <laughs> that's so exciting. Um, and I think one thing that's really important is when you're um, engaging uh, indigenous voices um, and perspectives and ways of knowing being into projects like what you work on, um, it's really important the timing of when you seek and implement that feedback. So, you know, what, at 
point in a project do you engage indigenous peoples? I think that that may be a, a, a question that I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on. Right at the beginning, when you're imagining what this project might be, uh, potentially even before funding is confirmed, um, municipalities need to connect with indigenous peoples and uh, create and strengthen those reciprocal relationships so that decision making is shared in, uh, in, in uh, major undertakings that are occurring in our territories, which is all of Canada. <laughs> so UNDRIP, the, I was so excited when I heard that it's been um, legislated, it's been backed up with legislation. So Canada adopted it some time ago, but it was not backed by legislation, now it is. So that means that every project uh, requires free, prior and informed consent for uh, decisions affecting our ancestral territories. So that really is every project. And, he, and I hope to see uh, incredible benefits to everyone, mainstream Canada, new Canadians, indigenous peoples, as we rediscover these dynamics in our own projects. Every single project I think needs this richness of understanding. And it's so easy to do because you just talk to indigenous people listen to what they say, and then you implement it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then continue following up. <laughs> no, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Lydia. Um, Naomi, I'm really curious, you know, from your perspective, um, as a student and the work that you're doing there, um, what have you been learning about city building, you know, with regards to reconciliation, writing relationships with Indigenous peoples. Um, I understand, as you mentioned earlier, that you released a book called Voices of the Land, um, as well as recently you launched 12 calls to action that your school can undertake um, to progress the conversation of, of reconciliation within um, a learning institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I guess personally for me with learning about city building, um, I've taken my time as a graduate student to really learn more specifically about how how we connect with land in a good way. I think the way that I that I learned about landscape architecture um, was really from a European perspective, if I'm being if I'm being um, perfectly candid, <laughs> which is not necessarily a bad thing. But I always felt that um, we were indigenizing spaces rather than building them from an indigenous perspective. And so I really struggled um, when I was really thinking about a career in landscape architecture because I was confused on how, where I fit within that. Um, and I think a lot of what Aladia was also saying too about representation, I didn't see a lot of Indigenous architects. I knew Dave Thomas and Cheyenne Thomas, his daughter. Those are the only two Indigenous architects that I knew, but I didn't know any Indigenous landscape architects. Um, fortunately for me now, I'm more connected and I know of some amazing people, but I agree with Lady. we need a lot more and I'm excited to keep building that capacity. Um, but yeah, so in terms of um, in, with Edma Education, it's really, I've been exploring how do we connect with land um, in a good way. And so with my practicum journey, um, so my, a little bit of, I'll give you a tiny history about my community. Um, so Peguis was originally at uh, the mouth of the Red River. We were known as St. Peter's Reserve and um, our reserve was illegally uh, surrendered um, to make room for Scottish settlers. And so then we were relocated to where present day Peguis is. And um, Peguis was actually one of, or St. Peter's was actually one of the first agricultural communities. And so when I, I knew this history, my whole life growing up, my dad always told me, but I didn't really understand how connected we were to the land. And so there was this huge disruption within our community, um, which is what really drove me um, to study it in my, in my practicum. Um, and again, there's some really great people in this profession that are doing some inspiring work. And so I see city built positive city building talks and rewriting of how we city build from an indigenous perspective happening all the time. Um, so Voices of the Land. So this was a publication that um, I released through the Indigenous Design and Planning Student Association um, in February of this year of 2021. And so it's a collect, we like to describe it as a collection of stories. And so it has um, 16 indigenous students who are currently enrolled um, in the Faculty of Architecture, which was a huge surprise in itself. When we had started the student association, we didn't know how many indigenous students we had. Um, and so to see 16 was so heartwarming and all of us gathered once a month. Um, we shared if we had, and it was just a great sharing time. We would share if we were frustrated with something, we would talk about our projects. And then we talk about exciting initiatives that we, that we wanted to do at our school. 
Um, and so Voices of the Land, again, um, it was a publication, had 16 students, um, and we interviewed um, practitioners. So there's four interviews at the end of the book um, that talk about just different perspectives in design. And Eladia was one of um, the fantastic practitioners that we, that we were able to interview. Um, and so the title of Voices of the Land was actually inspired by this quote that we found um, in the executive summary of the TRC report. Um, and so I'll read it quickly, but it says, um, I'm so filled with belief and hope because when I hear your voices at the table, I hear and know that the responsibilities of our ancestors are carried and are still being carried. Even through all of the struggles and even through all of what has been disrupted, we can still hear the voices of the land. And so that was by an Anishinaabe elder, um, Mary Delray. Um, and all four of the editors, we, we read that quote and I presented it to them and it just really sat with us. And we really felt that it just fit with the vision that we had and, you know, carrying on what has been disrupted and creating um, space for our voices to be heard. Um, and then uh, the 12 calls to action that you mentioned. So we've actually just released these calls to action this morning at 10 a.m. Winnipeg time. So they're pretty fresh. So this, I'm grateful to be speaking about them. Um, so myself and Rihanna Morasti, who is a uh, Woodlands Cree architecture, she recently just graduated with her actually, with her architecture degree. So congratulations to her if she's on this call. We were on a previous call before, so I don't know if she was able to join, but um, she's recently just finished her master's of architecture degree. Um, and so her and I with finishing our, our degrees soon um, and moving on into the work world, we really wanted to leave something behind at our school. Um, our school at the University of Manitoba has been has embraced us and our initiatives really well. Um, they've responded and they've just supported us in any way that we've that we've asked. Um, and so again, we wanted to just release uh, calls to action to leave behind so that we would be able um, just I guess maybe to describe a path as a, I think it's a famous Senator Murray Sinclair quote describing a path and it's up to you to to climb the mountain. So. Um, the 12 calls to action um, are noted in six different parts, um, which are summarized as recruitment, representation, advocacy, student body. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, paste a link in here to the official um, press release of the uh, calls to action report. Um, but essentially, yeah, this was just something that we put behind and we just said, okay, this is maybe what you can do to collaborate with um, and recognize Indigenous students and their perspectives, um, but also reaching out to the community, bringing in new students. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to see how it has been received so far. We've had a lot of support just for this. And um, that's kind of been my my role in school and really training as, a, as an emerging designer. And I think um, Lorna was saying this earlier, but um, you know, any lands that we practice on in Canada or anywhere in North America is indigenous lands. And so how we train designers to think about the land, I think is just equally as important um, and something that is emerging and I think is emerging well. I think it's, um, there's some really great people um, involved in these conversations and I'm just happy to have a, have a small part in that. Oh my gosh, that's so wonderful. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, so we're kind of towards the, the latter uh, end of the, our time together. So I'm, I'm gonna toss this over to uh, Danilo. Um, you know, from my conversations with knowledge keepers, elders and, and so on, you know, when speaking about their hopes for their descendants and future relations, um, I've always noticed this, they're very hesitant to be pres prescriptive of like, you know, you should do this, you should do this, you should invest in Bitcoin and so on. Um, so, you know, they, they instead really converge upon ideas that they hope those in the future will be able to essentially live a more indigenous way. Um, a more indigenous life and then provide the means for the next generation to do the same. So I'm really um, interested from your work as an indigenous student engagement coordinator for UBC's um, engineering um, services, you know, in what ways do you hope students are able to be more indigenous while engaging with the world of engineering? 
Um, and I, you know, that could be on a high level or something, you know, really small and tangible, um, exact, like it could be like demonetizing their means of living. So they're not, you know, really focused on that. They can focus on other things. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, um, I can feel, I can speak from my experience as a, uh, a recent engineering undergrad student and also from the indigenous students that I've, that I've met. So I, I can approach this from, from an Indigenous student perspective because uh, there isn't a lot of space or in any space within the engineering culture. And I know that this is gonna relate somewhat to planning and architecture as well, but there isn't much space for like Indigenous culture and identity within engineering. Um, you know, engineering students are, Indigenous engineering students are, are really underrepresented. And, you know, at UBC, we try to, um, to support our existing students um, by, creating a sense of culture so that they can bring that part of their identity with them. Um, but it's been very hard, you know, last year and a half, as everyone um, can attest. Um, now, we also try to um, tweak our admissions to recognize certain challenges that, that some Indigenous students have. Um, the other component, which is harder and less within our control, is, is attracting Indigenous students to engineering. And this would be the same for planning and architecture as well, is how do we, how do we inspire uh, prospective students to come to us. And, um, you know, at UBC, we have, we have an outreach program that reaches over 2000 Indigenous youth every year, but that's not going to close the gap above uh, itself, right? So we have this challenge. And, and if I could just park that for a second, I'll connect it to urban design and city building because they're related. Um, the, um, the example I'll use is like how we're adapting to climate change. Um, you know, uh, planners, architects, and engineers uh, we're all mitigating and adapting to changing weather um, and rising sea levels. And, you know, this is, this is demanding, you know, multidisciplinary teams to reimagine our spaces. Um, ways of knowing um, is in, in, in engineering curriculum is well underway at many universities. And one thing that I found is that there's this, there's this desire or a need to, to create a mapping from like, one concept in Western knowledge to the, con to, the, to the opposite in Indigenous knowledge. And I think that misses the point. Um, so the example I'll use is the notion of like the relationship to land. This has been mentioned today multiple times. And, um, and the sense that um, without creating a, a, a pan-Indigenous stereotype, um, this is always, this is usually held central. And in engineering education, there's really no space for the consideration of our relationship to the land. Um, rather, it's assumed that we'll have total control and dominance over the landscape. And, you know, as we reimagine our coastlines, for example, you know, we would do well to consider what kind of relationship we're fostering. And, you know, including Indigenous principles, at the outset, you know, we'll, we'll change the kind of questions we ask, you know, and, and, and obviously that will, that'll change the approaches that we take. Um, fostering a relationship that has a responsibility to, to all uh, past and future creation is, and, and one that, um, that, that is based on reciprocity, you know, as opposed to viewing the land as just something that you, that you build on and build over, um, you know, is something that is in contrary, it is contrary to like our approaches that we take, from my opinion. Um, you know, starting with the relationship to the land that the local Indigenous communities have, um, and then, um, you know, approaching problems with humility. You know, this is, this is an approach that I think this is, this is where Indigenous knowledges and worldviews can complement Western knowledge. You know, to return to the original question about, you know, how can um, professional practice enable our students um, to, to be more Indigenous? You know, and I'm speaking about our Indigenous students having to traditionally leave their, their culture at the door. Um, if, if in professional practice, we include the wisdom and culture of Indigenous uh, uh, communities, you know, the spaces are going to reflect those values. You know, and prospective students are going to see themselves reflected in the landscape around them, the urban design, the cities. And that'll, that'll, that'll inspire them to be part of this. You know, to Olivia's point, like we need more, you know, we more need more women architects. Well, maybe 
it's not we're not drawing our people to these professions because they don't see themselves within it, right? So um, I think that if we can incorporate um, principles of Indigenous knowledge into our cities, students will, will naturally be drawn to these because they'll see some of the values of their community in the professions. And, and they won't have, they'll know that they don't have to check their identities at the door. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Danilo. It's like so powerful um, and, and absolutely wonderful. And, you know, as we close our time together, I just want to kind of make uh, make this space open. Um, we have a couple of moments and then I'll do a quick closing prayer. But would anyone like to share any final thoughts, um, uh, anything that you hope the folks listening, uh, you know, carry with them? Uh, we, we don't have to hear from everyone. So if you're like, I said my piece, we're good to go. Yeah, yeah, Lorna. Please. Well, well, I just wanted to say um, thank you uh, um, as, as you close here for allowing us to, to voice um, who we are as Indigenous people and um, what we feel in terms of our uh, Indigenous perspectives. And I hope um, we can continue to bring our con Indigenous perspectives to the table because they're really important perspectives, especially at this sort of or this time and place that we're in, as we discuss um, things like on drip, truth and reconciliation. And I hope folks will understand that we are speaking our truth as we come to the table, but we need somebody listening to those truths as well. So thank you for that. And um, always again, open to, to learning. I, I learn from our traditional knowledge keepers and we hope to share that information with others. So thank you for that. Awesome. Hi, hi. Amazing. Well, on that note, I'll, I'll say a few words just to wrap us off in a, in a good way, wrap us up. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. So um, yeah, I want to give thanks for, for everyone um, from across the country from, from joining in and spending time with us this morning. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to um, our ancestors, those family members, those loved ones that came and joined us and sat with us today and the creator and made such a, a safe, um, exciting and warm place for us to share, you know, our thoughts and, and our hearts with each other um, and to come together in that spirit of peace and friendship and understanding, you know, that's at the heart of our relationships um, as Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Um, so I want to give thanks to that. And I also want to, uh, to uh, send our uh, relatives and, and, and those on the other side home um, and thank them once again for spending time with us. And uh, hi, hi, Kenan Eskomitan. Amazing. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. Please have a wonderful day. Happy National Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and I, I hope to see you again soon. Hi, hi. Bye, Mappy.